Okay, um, so maybe uh, we should start. So uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Center for Wireless Communications semi-annual research review. I want to thank all of you for coming, and especially those who came from faraway places, uh, including the East Coast. I hope that your families and colleagues are doing okay. Um, I was, the, the reviews are held in early May and very early November, like now November 2nd, and I was walking outside the evening, uh, in the evening just a couple days ago, and I got scared, and not only because um, it is a very spooky time of the year, and not only even because of next Tuesday, but also because this is the 35th uh, research review for the Center for Wireless Communication, so we have a lot to live up to. Uh, but um, we also have a very good lineup of speakers, so I'm sure we'll do all right. And I think we should start, you'll see that everything is scheduled up to like a microsecond here, so we can stop at noon. So maybe we should start and uh, invite the first uh, speaker, Rene Cruz. Um, Rene uh, received his bachelor's and uh, graduate degrees from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and uh, from MIT. And um, uh, I found out that uh, when he graduated high school, he was uh, voted the most intellectual. And in his 20th reunion, which happened just a couple of days ago, let's say, uh, uh, he was voted uh, the most changed. And I don't think they were talking about his looks. So uh, <laughs> Renee, please come. Thank you so much, and I do appreciate you coming here early in the morning to hear me speak about this topic, which actually is a pretty dear topic to myself. Actually, I've been working on this problem for close to several, well, I don't know, several years now, and uh, the truth of the matter is I uh, haven't really talked about it much. Uh, I've been extremely excited about it, um, but I haven't been really that successful at getting other people excited about it, so I was... I took the opportunity to kind of invite myself here to uh, the, the review to try to, so I could get an audience, and I, I, I appreciate the audience. So hopefully um, uh, the, to the, the topic will be interesting to you as well as, well as myself. So I, uh, my collaborator is uh, a PhD student, Mr. F. John Poirez at UCSD, and, uh, um, and we've written a couple of papers on this, and I'm just uh, kind of giving you the latest sort of spin on, on this, so. Um, okay, so let's see, how do I page down or something, or? Huh? Be there. Okay. So I had to be, use my imagination, and I also had to be a little pretty, uh, do a little clever uh, copying, pasting to get that question mark to have no jagged edges. But uh, basically, this is my important, most important slide, and I don't think we actually ask this question enough as engineers because uh, we just kind of dive into whatever we're doing, and I, I'm certainly as guilty as anyone else for doing this. But it is kind of actually interesting to kind of step back and ask ourselves as engineers, as communication engineers, what should we actually be working on? Um, and I guess uh, I wanted to put some backdrop to this slide and just to try to put, you know, some clever little story. And I guess to, to, sub, to paraphrase my entire talk uh, in, you know, like three, or three sentences, it might be something like, uh, should we be happy? Are we happy? And if we're not happy, how could we get more happy? And is it possible to be happy? And I think it maybe it's possible to be happy, but so the question is now, why aren't we happy? What problem are, are we going to try to solve? Why aren't we happy? So in my mind, uh, this may be a little bit controversial, but the reason I am not happy is I, I've noticed that the internet was designed to be this great thing, to be this super distributed, super robust communication infrastructure where uh, be very resilient to attacks, like anything that goes down, you can still communicate, that kind of thing. 
One thing that just kind of noticed that over the years as the architecture has evolved is really the essential control of the internet has evolved to where uh, it's become highly centralized due to the spectacular success of a few companies. But um, essentially, if you really think about it, how much information, how much control is really passing through the essential elements of today's infrastructure, namely search engines, uh, social networking sites, as well as public messaging sites. It really has a profound impact on our how information is disseminated. You know, <clears throat> and I think it's a pretty good model. I, I'm not. I'm not trying to cr criticize. Obviously, it's a pretty good uh, system, but uh, to many people, it's not really so good. Um, we kind of forget about that. I mean, there are large amounts of people in the world that you could argue, potentially argue, are not seeing the information that they want to see, or maybe should see, possibly. That true. I mean, I, I, it's kind of my perception. So, so just think about how much, you know, if you trust the entities involved, and most people do, including myself, do today. But will that always be the case that you can trust the central infrastructure to with the information that it's providing you? So that just that's kind of a backdrop. You know, to be honest, that's not the problem. I, I this is not the problem I really set out. It's one problem that I uh, kind of noticed over the years as I was working on this other problem, which is in this other thing was we were kind of working, looking at these this communication problem where you actually have the possibility of a very high bandwidth communication between <clears throat> two nodes that are in close proximity and very efficient in terms of uh, power and efficiency and, and all that. And the other nice thing about it from a human perspective, if you don't pay for I mean it's you know you don't have to pay anyone for it it's like it's mine it's my ex you know it's my free space around me I, I'm free to communicate as many bits per second as long as I pay you know my battery to, to go to the next person and it, it's there's this illusion that somehow that since it's between two people in close, close proximity maybe it's psychological that it's somehow more <clears throat> free in another sense, meaning that it's not controlled or can't be monitored, for example. Um, and so it's really interesting in the context of technology because this is where it seems <clears throat> that this is kind of happening. I mean, these devices that we have are capable of communicating device to device, not necessarily optimized for that. but. Certainly the capability is there and the storage costs are also going down quite a bit. So it's just that combination of technology trends is pretty interesting. So anyway, I only have 10 slides here, so it shouldn't be too bad. So the real question is, if you have just kind of an intellectual question, and people have asked this before, is, is since you have these capability to communicate person to person or in close range in a free way, so to speak, Shouldn't it be possible to devise a new global network where it kind of operates differently than before that's not somehow vulnerable to these sorts of attacks because it's not centralized? And I, the reason I ask this question is I believe, but many of my colleagues actually believe it's not possible. That's why I'm kind of out on this mission to say maybe it is possible. And maybe I can convince you that maybe it is possible. And I think there are a lot of question marks about this, and I'm not not necessarily pointing them out, it's kind of up to you to figure out where all the big question marks and what I'm about to present. So essentially, let's see. It kind of comes back to some really basic assumptions that we kind of ask ourselves about what a communication network does. Um, I think in the beginning, you know, there was telephone basically, and that really defined the, the usual communication model that people always use, let's face it. It's pretty much one-to-one -one communication. I'm one person, I wanna talk to another person, I wanna transmit bits to that other person, and that's pretty much it. I wanna go between any two nodes on the network, and the network should support that. So that's an interesting model in the sense that it's completely uh, devoid of what actually the messages are. 
we don't care what the message is. They're just bits. We just what, what we care about is the infrastructure, how the nodes are connected up, how how they're configured, and so forth. So what I'm kind of interested in is something on conceptually sort of the dual of that. I mean, is at the other extreme where you kind of take the completely opposite design approach and say, wait a second, infrastructure is too complicated and unpredictable. I'd like to consider a different model where we don't make any assumptions or very little assumptions on the infrastructure, but instead we model the data instead of the, the infrastructure. And it's kind of just an interesting intellectual exercise, and that's kind of what I've been carrying out. And so it's kind of interesting. I call this model star to one communication. So what it, what it is, so this is the model that we're gonna try to put forth here. And it's kind of a different model where the, the model is, whole system model is sent around the, the messages. And basically you have a, a lot of messages and a lot of users, right? But the, the, the idea, which I believe hopefully is useful in practice, is that everyone is only interested in the messages that they're interested in, period. That's it. I'm interested in these messages. You're interested in those messages. Whatever. Everyone has their own personal preferences, and they want to get the messages they want. The problem, though, is that there's a lot of messages. And it takes a lot of work, potentially, to get the messages that you want us, you know, because it takes a lot of processing. Actually, it would take you a lot of processing because you'd have to go through all the messages and say, which ones do I like and which ones do I, don't I want and give me the ones that I want. So that's the model anyway, is that you have a lot of messages then everyone is interested in getting the messages that they want. It kind of sounds a little vague at this point, but that's what it is. And then in terms of the infrastructure, and actually I am making a fair amount of assumptions here, this is actually a strong assumption, not a weak one, but, uh, but it is weak in some sense. All I, I'm not really assuming I know anything about the infrastructure other than that pairs of users interact, random pairs of users interact, have the opportunity to interact with each other. And I guess the strong assumption I'm making is that it's completely uniform over the entire population, to make it simple. But let's just see what happens when, when you uh, do that. So actually, I've, I hate to admit this, but we're actually pretty serious about this idea. And so one nice thing about um, not making infra assumptions on the infrastructure, it allows you to build things. In particular, we, since we don't have, even though it's possible today, to have device-to-device -to -device communication, since we're not making any assumptions on the infrastructure, we can build a system today that works with today's infrastructure, namely the internet. Because we can use the internet to go between two devices, any two devices. Of course, we can also make use of short range wireless when that technology comes available. And I put the shoe in there to remind myself <coughs> this thing that people call, I don't know where this term came from, it's called sneaker net. And basically, it's the concept of, you know, it's like the Federal Express model. You take the CD, you put it on Federal Express, and you mail it, and that's a better way of getting the bits, you know, from X to Y. And that's kind of what we're talking about here. It's just all I'm saying really here is there's a, you can consider time to be a elastic dimension where, you know, things are connected, right, since there's just a time shift, but they're very connected, richly connected when you kind of consider time shifts as being irrelevant, so to speak. Okay, so the model then is you have this large number of devices and they randomly communicate. So I'll, I'll get to the point quickly here. So really, uh, I, the way I like to think of it, it's, it's the problem is like finding needles in a haystack. It's like you have a lot of hay, where the pieces of hay are the messages, right? billions and billions of messages. But you as a person, you're only interested in say 50 of those uh, pieces of hay because those are your favorite messages. And you over there, you're interested in another 50 message, not necessarily the same as mine. But everyone out throughout the world is interested in their 50 best pieces of hay. That's a pretty daunting problem and, and actually what we have really implicitly is what I would call 
an axiom of choice here, if you're familiar with measure theory. But basically, it's imp really impossible, of course, for everyone to go through each piece of content and say, I like this one better than that one, because there's just too much content, it's too much work, too many messages. But theoretically, we could imagine that there's a choice function that if you had enough time and energy to go through every single piece of content, you would rank them and you would have a well-defined 50 pieces of best hay. And so the problem then is for everyone, everyone has a bunch of hay in front of them, which is just random hay, basically. Maybe they can look at, you know, just a small number of pieces of hay that's in front of them, but we have a very large population of people that are just, you know, distributed throughout this hay. And the question is, can we quickly find, can we collectively all find our 50 best pieces of hay without doing very much work. And the remarkable thing, and, and this is sort of, you know, uh, disturbing to those of, of us who want to be individuals, but basically, I'm going to present a very uh, efficient algorithm for, for solving this problem, and it, it really relies on people really not being individuals. I hate to say it, but the fact that we're all kind of the same. And so, we all kind of have similar preferences, even though they're not the same preferences. Statistically, by definition almost, we all have the same preferences because that's the way we're modeling it. And so if you look at models for message popularity, for example, people have done this sorts of things like look at the total revenue of movies, you know, over the infinite history, just look at, you know, the most popular movie, the next most popular movie, and you could use revenue as a proxy for interest. And you'll find that the, the, the popularity of the movie, the revenue of the movie, follows a power law. And you know, throughout nature, throughout communication models, this is a very popular thing that just happens for whatever reason. These things just, popularity just happens to follow this power law. So the question is, so if you believe that, so if you believe my model, which is really what you have to believe. So I have a model where you, rank the messages in terms of their popularity, and we assume that the popularity dies out as a power law, like 1 over k raised to some power z. And really, that's what makes this algorithm super powerful, because uh, we all kind of think alike, more or less. So since we all think alike, we can use our neighbors, basically, to do our work for us, basically. In a very strong statistical sense, we kind of, and this is no nothing new. This is what this whole algorithm is what people do. I'm sorry, this is what people do to find their content now. We are very lazy species. We do not read through things ourselves. We ask our neighbor, "Hey, what did you like?" And then if we like it, then that's what we like, and that's basically what the algorithm is. So let me st state this. So essentially, we have all the messages randomly spread throughout the population at first, and the problem is that most of us are looking at garbage, you know, bad messages. And that's kind of how it starts out, but ma magically we're going to see that people can only look at about 300 messages, roughly. O only have to look at 300 pieces of hay, and then after that time, they, with very high probability, they have their 50 best pieces of hay. And that's kind of what's going on here. So the algorithm really fits on one page. It's, as I already told you, basically what it is, you can formalize this, but basically to make it practical, you have this local cache of your, your let's say our 100 best pieces of hay. We're going for the 50 best pieces of hay, but we'll actually have a local cache of 100 pieces of, that can store 100 pieces of hay. And basically what we're, it's very simple. Everyone just has their cache and that's their favorite messages, period. But except they're going to be roughly ranked a little bit. You have to roughly rank those messages in your local cache. So that's the whole algorithm. People just get their hay, they rank it, they put it in, you know, if there's too many of them, they throw some of them out so it fits in the local cache. And that's it, literally. And then when you interact with your neighbor, what do you do? You say, hey, what do you got there? What's your best pieces of hay? So the, what we can do efficiently is if we can uh, have a, unique namespace for all the messages, and this is the dual of infrastructure center where we had a unique uh, namespace for all the nodes. Here we have a unique namespace for all the messages, right? And so when we 
encounter people, they'll say, okay, I have these messages, these are the IDs, so we can do it very quickly and efficiently. And what we can do is we can kind of remember as we talk to different people, hey, I, I keep hearing about that message. Maybe I should ask about that message. So what basically what you do is you have a, a database which you can make, implement with a hash table, if you're familiar with that. But basically, you just remember about every ID you've heard about, and you implement a counter for it. You just count up every time you heard about that message. And then what you do when you ask someone for their best messages, you look at what they have, and then you look compare that to your entire database and say, what is the most popular message that that guy has that I don't have? And then ask him, would you please give me that message, one message? And that's what happens at most one message happens in every interaction. And that's the entire algorithm. Uh, and so, of course, when you get when you ask for that message and you get, you have to do some work, right? You, you get that new message and, and this is what the catch of the whole thing. You have to look at that message and say, do I like this message? Do I like this message better than the ones in my local cache? If so, I'll replace something, the worst message in my local cache with this one and that's it. Otherwise, I'll throw the message away. So this is kind of what we do. And the, and the, the remarkable thing is, you know, and that's kind of what's happening with the simulations, it actually does work in a very strong sense. We actually do, with very, very high probability, get the messages that we're most interested in with very, very, very efficiently. So I have to, I think I'll skip this part, but basically you have this concept of happiness uh, and because since we have the concept of a favorite message for each person, we can measure the happiness of, of a single person basically with this cost function where, you know, this is, describes the reward we get for obtaining the messages with that particular rank. So all the messages with rank 1, 2, up to G, we get the same reward for because we don't really care the best, worst, you know, just the top 50. And then anything below that, we don't give ourselves any reward for. So you just, us as God looking at the simulation, we know what the messages are. We can say whether that person got their favorite messages or not because we've created this synthetic simulation that I'm about to show you. What so, well, I guess I should say that for this happiness function for one person will be equal to one if and only if that person gets all of their 50 messages, right? So the higher that number is to one, that means that you got your 50 messages. And if it's equal to one, you got every single one of your 50 messages. Oops. So then we can add this up over all the users and take the average and say, you know, the system is completely happy. If the system has a total happiness, average happiness of one, that means every single person got their top 50 messages, G messages. So here's the simulation I ran. And actually what's uh, interesting is there is definitely some sort of stochastic limit going on here. When you do different simulations, you get almost exactly the same curve every time. I believe the solution to this is following a, some sort of differential equation or something like that. But basically what's happening is if you plot what's happening versus the iterations, here we're trying to get the 50 top messages, and each iteration is what I said before, where every member of the population interacts randomly with someone else and asks them what their favorite message is and does that algorithm, that step that I just described. And so what you can see here is that after about 300 iterations or so, which is about uh, when you're trying to get the top 50 messages, so about six times that, of course, that we had to have a cache of 100 messages in this particular example. But the remarkable thing is that it really, it's it's on the same, it's essentially proportional to the number of messages that you're trying to get. So the constant proportionality being six, right? So if you wanted to get 100 messages, you have to look through 600 messages in order to guarantee that you get your top 100. So the real question, and I think, you know, I'll just close with this, is uh, you, you get some sensitivity, by the way. I, I had to assume something about the ZIF parameter, and of course, uh, I, I assumed it was like two or two and a half, which is kind of a run-in-the-mill number. Usually these things range between one and four. 
And uh, I did a simulation over the entire range of, and it all looks pretty much the same through the entire range, except maybe instead of the constant being six, it might be 20 maybe, for if, if Z were 1.1, for example. But I think the real question here, I, I just kind of uh, put forth this model. I think, you know, it, and, and these are things I'm struggling with now, is really what does this model mean? What are the messages? You know, am I serious about this model? Would you actually implement this exactly like I described, where you have, you know, where you can imagine people be going around and saying, okay, what's your 50 messages? What, you know, could that really happen? I mean, are we serious about this? Or would that never happen? Uh, and it's a really interesting question, sort of engineering question. And I'm a little bit, uh, I'm not sure, actually. I think someday it could literally be interpreted literally. But today, I believe you're probably not going to get critical mass. So what is possible, though, is to uh, partition the space. So for example, you could do this about anything. For example, you could use this algorithm for, and this is an interesting application of this, for a search engine, for a search engine that's powered by people, where basically the topic is a, a, a list of keywords, right? And so that list of keywords, a lot of people are going to be interested in that list of keywords, and they will have their uh, best messages for that keyword. The messages would be a link. Here's my favorite link for that keyword. And so you have billions of Ent contribute in entries, which are, you know, my favorite link, but how are you going to sort them out efficiently to, so that you get the best links in a fully distributed way? Well, here's a way. So that's, that's what's kind of interesting about this. And they're really the possibilities of this type of approach are really l limitless, really. So it's not, we're not even limiting to wireless. I mean, we're talking about another type of infrastructure you could do to build search engines, for example. So anyway, that's my talk, so, yep. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I would, it would be pretty interesting to, calculate what is the happiness function right now and I would I would say it's probably less than 0.7 <laughs> but I don't know yeah yeah no time is an interesting one I've normalized things by iteration that's really the key point really that's kind of what I was talking about before What's actually happening here? I mean, reality would be maybe you don't have random interactions. You talk to your neighbor. You talk to the same people. So one interesting question is what, what about this model of, about random interactions? Okay, well, first of all, how are you going to achieve it? It's possible to achieve it with the help of websites and things like that. But uh, beyond that is what happens when people really uh, form friendships or uh, persistent relationships where they keep going back to the same people uh, that they're you know share some common interest or something like that. That's super interesting. I mean that's just we just I mean we're just scratching the surface here. Now I believe the worst case is actually the random interaction when you actually go to people you're interested. You actually do better with some with some random interaction. It's a pretty interesting thing because people. The, the human network is pretty, the diameter is pretty small. So it's kind, of, it's kind of interesting to see what could happen with something like this. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's too biased to assume that there's a random act. By that I mean, you go to YouTube some days, you may see a video and you say, I have no interest in the data about that. But two million people, it's not free money. I'm not interested in the data. I'm interested in the fact that two million people were interested. Absolutely. No, you couldn't be, I mean, literally, I mean, that's why I see the opportunity here. I mean, when I read news stories, to be honest, to me, the comments are more interesting than the news story itself, and, and people don't seem to get that at all. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. No, it's, it's, I've noticed myself, like I go to certain sites and I'll click on something and then I come back five minutes later and gee, that thing is now all of a sudden the top thing. And I go, is that because I clicked on it? Probably. They're smart people. They're, they're, they're trying to make money. They put whatever, they have to put whatever people are interested in. So they do experiments. They put stuff there. People clicked on it. Hey, you know, run it up the flagpole, you know, that kind of thing. So... Well, that's the interesting thing here, which was sort of humbling, is that, okay, people, even though you have your own interests, if you like something, there's probably still a good chance that a fair number of people also like that. Even though you're not that popular, there's still some, you know, you're not, most people don't like something that they're the only person in the world that they like that. Right, right. <laughs> See, but that's down on the list. That's like K equal 10,000 or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks.